think so. All right, I'll talk All while right. you bring her up. In case. Let me uh, bring her up. <laughs> so I'm super excited to have back Lisa Leason. You've seen her on our channel before. We have a series called Researching Around the 1890s Census Brick Wall, or Black Hole, excuse me. That's when in the United States we had a fire and then poorly cared for records, which damaged pretty much all the rest of the records. But there's 6,000 names that still survive in the 1890 census. So it's kind of a black hole for a lot of people. You have to bridge the gap between 1880 to 1900 in the US um, record research catalog. So she and I have an eight part series on her YouTube channel. You'll want to have to check that out. She's also talked about how do you find that records offline? And what else did she talk about? So many things. I am so glad that she is here today. Hey, Lisa, how are you? Hey, how are you guys? I'm so excited to be here. Yeah. Okay, so you've been sitting in the wings. What is the one yep. meal that you wish that you could have that your ancestors ate? So it's probably not meals as much as specific foods, but cornbread. Oh, my, okay. My grandmother, who learned it from her mother, I mean, that was the family thing. And it has to be done in a cast iron skillet. Okay. Cast iron why. skillet cornbread. It makes the crisper. It's just crispier. It's oh. on the outside. Yeah. Okay. See, I'm not the chef in the family. He he does the cooking really well. I can I can feed us so that we can survive. He feeds us and it tastes good. Yeah, but surviving is always a good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, we're doing freezer meal cooking um, tonight and tomorrow. So that's we prepare all of our dinners uh -huh. ahead. And then we thaw them out and eat them throughout the month. That's really handy. Anyway. Yes. So... How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. I am doing great. So what kind of research projects have you, have you been working on lately? What have I been? I've been really focused a lot on my, a couple great, great grandmothers who are just really brick walls for me. Mm -hmm. And, and they have been for a long time and I get a little clue here and a little clue there. And then sometimes I just go, I don't know what to do with them. And I just put them on the shelf for a few <laughs> months and then I pull them back out. Uh -huh. So that's kind of what I've been doing this summer is really going back over some of that old research just okay. to see just to see what maybe I missed the first time around right absolutely and you've also had a 31 yeah 31 yes. series I've had a 31 day series mm -hmm. it's it's still going on it's for the month of July it's 31 um oh I just blanked out I get 31 out of the box genealogy tips okay cool. I so thought it was day. uncommon this year and last year it was out of the box or did you just recycle the names I just recycle the name and, oh, okay. and just I've updated. I've updated a lot of the posts, okay. and um, I use uncommon and out of the box really just kind of interchangeably um, to help yeah. people. If people, because some people really don't weren't quite sure what the out of the box thing meant. So oh, okay. I just use it both. I see. I see. Yeah, yeah. but it's still going on. Um, so every day, you know, this on social media, check my Facebook page. You can check you and and this year I did add videos. So okay. every day for 31 days, there's a new YouTube video showing up on my YouTube channel. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with the tits, so. I love it. I love it. I love it. Because yep. we like YouTube. <laughs> All right. So we're going to dive in on today's topic, which is finding female ancestors. And you have four tips to help us try to find our female ancestors. So the tip number one that you said was mm -hmm. don't overlook the obvious. So can you tell us more about what you mean and how do we apply that tip? Sure. Sometimes I think that we as genealogy researchers, we get so excited when we're starting our research. You know, you go, you clip right along and you, you find that census record and you, you know, you find the photos and then you just keep going and then you hit that brick wall. And I think sometimes we're creating our own brick walls because oh. we are skipping some basic research things that we need to do and we're overlooking the obvious. I always like to tell people, you know, just don't assume a record doesn't exist because it didn't show up on your side of the family. So okay. when you're looking for your ancestor, you know, we want to start with what's known at home, but we kind of get off track. We get going down the, the regular records, but really for some of our modern generations and even two to three generations back, there's a lot of oral history. There's a lot of stuff still that can be within the family records that would solve a family mystery that happened you know, several generations back, but we're forgetting to ask. And the problem right. is we're remembering that it didn't, the answer might not be on our side of the family. Maybe that family Bible that we, every, every genealogist wants, but, but, you know, people go, but Lisa, this family Bible didn't, doesn't exist. We don't have one. 
And that's when I always go back and go, are you sure? Right. Be- because, you know, that family Bible has those females in it. And I used to I always like to use the example that when I was working with to get my ancestor as into the DAR, proven as a patriot. And it was, I'm going to be honest, it was one of the easiest ones I've ever done because I had everything. <laughs> right. I, had, I mean, it was like, bam, 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 just fill out the paperwork. You're done. Lucky you. <laughs> I know. And as soon as his, as soon as they approved him and he got, I started getting phone calls and I started getting emails from um, folks who were off a different lawn. Mm-hmm. And they're like, we have been trying to connect to this lawn for years. How did you do it? And I said, well, the family Bible, <laughs> I have a copy. And there was dead silence on the telephone. And this woman goes, you mean to tell me there's a family Bible? <laughs> I said, yeah. And so I shared it with her and, mm-hmm. you know, they connected their line. But here's the key. In North Carolina, the North Carolina Digital Collections at the archives has a family Bible records collection. Nice. A copy of that family Bible was there. Oh, wow. And they had never looked for it. Okay. And it was it was there online. Mm-hmm. You know, so that's what I like to tell people is just because it didn't come down your side of the family, make sure you're looking for those records that whether it's a Bible, whether it's letters, whether it's, you know, oral history stories, make sure you're you're going down those other lines. Yeah. Well, and that kind of ties into um, I've had two cases. So I had a girlfriend that I was working with her on a kind of a complicated case about her aunt. And we scoured the internet, all that stuff. Well, two years after we worked on it and we just couldn't move the needle, she called me up and said, um, I was cleaning out my house and I found this letter that I've had for 25 years and I haven't looked at And oh, it has the answer. I'm like, are you oh, kidding Lord. me? <laughs> And then, so some of our viewers may know of our, my research over the shoulder, my shoulder series about um, G. Winfield Underwood. And so I, I, so I worked with the person about the case. Then I made a whole series of YouTube videos. And then when the last one went out, she said, oh, mm, I have answers. And I'm like, you're <sighs> kidding me. She's like, I have a family Bible that has all the answers that we've been trying to prove. And oh, by the way, his middle name is, and then we have the middle name. I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. So (laughs) don't overlook the obvious and make sure you've gone through your house. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. And reached out to those third cousins and those great aunts and uncles and things like that. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And so many, for me, my family had a big family feud. So on one line, I couldn't talk to anybody. But as Mm -hmm. soon as I opened it up, I was able to talk to people. And man, did my world just open up pictures I've never seen stories I've wow. never heard of um just amazing things so talking to people but you have to do it fast because people die mm-hmm. fires happen absolutely absolutely anyway so anything else you want to tell us about what what are other obvious things we might be overlooking I think just when you're I think when I think of the obvious thing I always just tell people when you're getting into those basic genealogy records like the census records and things like that is don't just grab your ancestor and run. <laughs> because right. it's, a very, it's very tempting to just, okay, there she is, there's her husband, there are her kids, move on to the next census record. Mm-hmm. But take time to really read that record right. and um, make sure that you know, you know, read every single column so that you really get, can get an understanding of who she was mm-hmm. in that time period. Yeah, and then totally. look, and then I always, at minimum, I go five pages forward and five pages back in a census mm-hmm. record. And if I'm really struggling, I'll I'll just read the whole district. Quite frankly, <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've I've done it. Um, yeah. To to understand who is in the community, uh-huh. because maybe it doesn't make sense right that moment, mm-hmm. but as I start to build clues, I know who's in the community, and I can start to recognize um, if they had an impact on her life. Absolutely. I have I have one that, uh, and this is this is more particular to a certain record sets. Like for instance, in in England, um, when you're looking at the the birth or the baptism records. Mm-hmm. Once you get back to about the 1700 to the middle 1600s, they stopped recording the, uh, the mom. Um, they only oh. are recording the dad. However, a lot of the families followed this, it is a little bit complicated naming tradition of where 
the first male was named after the paternal grandfather. The second mm-hmm. male was named after the maternal grandfather. And then the same with the daughters. Mm-hmm. They were named mm-hmm. after the grandmothers first and then maybe aunts or uncles. So let's say that you have somebody that you're trying to figure out who their mom's name is. Well, if you have a sister, if it's a male and you have a sister, look at the names of their kids because the first couple of uh, girls might yeah. be what the name of that mother is. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's, you know, just one thing that I was looking at. Now, not everybody follows that tradition. They don't always follow it exactly. But uh, mm-hmm. it's, you know, something that, that if you if you understand that, hey, there are these naming traditions. And maybe if you see that tradition in that family where you do know all the names, mm-hmm. well, mm-hmm. it's a good hint that this tradition has been passed down. And so... You might have that name, even though that name isn't recorded anywhere. It's recorded in the kids. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, absolutely. then I, I also said you were saying turn the pages forward and backward in census records. But I was looking at a marriage certificate and I went forward and backwards and discovered mm-hmm. there was a back page. And on that back page, the lady, the, the bride had to have her father sign off that she could uh. be married because she was underage. And boom. All of a sudden, I went back a generation because I had a father's nice. name, and I, I her name was Smith. It wasn't like I was <laughs> yeah. really going to be able to go that, that far, but I had a new name because I turned that page. That's a great tip. Mm-hmm. All right, so let's see. Tip number two was networking genealogy style. What do you mean oh, about yeah. that? Oh, this is one of my favorite. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. So we, we know how to network for our business lives, right? When you're in your out in the corporate world and stuff, we know how to network. We know what that is, but we can do that genealogy wise. And that means reaching out to um, other cousins. That means reaching out to other researchers, um, reaching out to historical societies, genealogy groups, talking to people who live in a certain area. Mm-hmm. So maybe you're not, Maybe, you know, your ancestors came from a particular county in North Carolina, and maybe, you know, you're researching from Texas. And so maybe you don't know anybody there, but if you contact somebody in the Genealogy Society, you know, you can find out, give me some, what would you look for? What are some tips? What are some things that I might not find online kind mm-hmm. of thing? I do this in my family all the time because it turns out, you know, my grandmother was from a very large family. Mm-hmm. And I knew all these names, and I didn't know. And I thought, they've got the answers and I want these answers. Now I'm, I'm pretty shy or introverted. I don't really like to do this, but I was like, I want those answers. <laughs> so I got the names of all these distant cousins and aunts and uncles. And I wrote snail mail. I wrote a letter and just introduced myself and said, I'm the great granddaughter of so-and-so. And my m- grandmother was so-and-so and mm-hmm. I'm going to call you next week. Nice. And every single time I called, made that phone call, I got, they would pick up the phone and go, I have been waiting for your phone call and, you know, would just share everything. Some of them I actually got to go meet. Some of them just was phone interviews. But here's the thing. When you're networking and you're reaching out to other people, never leave that conversation without asking them, who else should I talk to? Oh, that's a great tip. Always ask. So whether it's your cousin, who else in the family should I talk to? Who else would have those photographs? Who Mm -hmm. else? That right. kind of, who else, if you're talking to other genealogy researchers, who else have you talked with? Who else do you work with? Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I do this like at the county courthouse or at the county libraries because I like to go to the libraries at the counties cause, and talk to the librarians. Mm-hmm. And they, because of the librarians don't know your answers, mm-hmm. they re- they pretty be pretty sure they know somebody who knows an answer somewhere. Right. So they're going to, yeah. I always ask and, and reach out to see because it really does, when you get to, network and you kind of build some of those research relationships, Mm -hmm. you know, people will will come back to you later and go, I found this and thought about you or this, this will pertain to your research kind of thing. So I think it's really important that we reach out. um, I like that tip. You know, mm -hmm. I hadn't thought about it, but I did do that one time when I was in, um, I was at the Ohio State Archives. This was actually 10 years ago when Andy was kind Mm -hmm. enough to let me go by myself for a week to research in Ohio and I got to the archive and I couldn't, I mean, I did my pre-research, I figured out what collections I wanted to look at, I get into the microfiche, I knew where I needed to go next, but nothing pointed me to the next step, like nothing. And mm-hmm. so I went to the desk and I asked for help and I was like, "Where? how do I get to the next step? I have this information, how do they get to the next step? 
Um, so I didn't say who else do I not need to talk to, but thankfully they knew because they're like, let me introduce you to this woman. And I forget her first name, but her last name was Blue. It was just lovely. <laughs> and he's like, let me introduce you to Mrs. Blue. She knows exactly. And they did. She helped me. She got me over that hurdle to the what that next step. So um, that's a great tip, even though I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's well, so I think obvious. we do it. I, I think a lot of times we do it kind of, uh-huh. but we're not we're not. Because we just, we you know we all like to talk about our genealogy, <laughs> but right. um but I I think when you're very intentional about mm-hmm. who you're seeking out to talk with, that's can be very beneficial. I like that. Very good. Very good. Now, um, some networking things that I've discovered of late are Facebook groups. So, do you have mm-hmm. any Facebook groups that you find are beneficial in that networking when you don't have any cousins to work with, but you're trying to research in a particular area? There's some great, there, there are a lot of great ones out there. You can reach out to a lot of the counties. We'll have them. For instance, I research in Halifax County, Virginia. Okay. And so there's a Halifax County, Virginia okay. um, Facebook group. So I've done that. And like, I've put photographs up there and said, Hey, does anybody recognize, you know, this person or mm-hmm. ask questions and I can answer questions too. And of course I have, are you my cousin Facebook group that um, people, <laughs> And, and people, I literally have people from around the world in that group. And so it's really nice. You can put questions in there and there's probably somebody who's in that area who's right. going to, who, or who has experience for a certain area. And, and they're a great group of people. They always reach out. Absolutely. And, and Andy, answer. you've dropped the link to your Facebook group right before you oh, said that. Thank you. <laughs> great minds think alike. There you go. Um, Keep going. Oh, well. I'm looking up something. <laughs> well, I was oh, going to okay. try to get you to go to the next slide while you're looking up something. Can you hit that next slide? There I we can. go. Now you can get back to what you're doing. That's okay. He's on tech duty and I'm on talking duty. <laughs> That's the way we like it. <laughs> well, for, no, real quick, just as a side, for those yeah. of you out there, when you're talking, when you're watching a live TV show, you know, like the news or something, mm-hmm. you got somebody or some group of people that mm-hmm. all they do is sound, mm-hmm. but there's probably somebody for every single person's microphone. Yeah. And then you got, you know, Three or four different camera operators. Mm-hmm. And then you got the director who's telling which angles the cameras are to come through. And the person with the script. And then you got the person with the script which that's giving them the script that they have. And then have. you also have, you know, the person that's in charge of the subtitles along the bottom. Yeah. And, that's you know, so there's, there's lots of people. This is all condensed down to... You and me. Yeah, just us. So <laughs> think of all those jobs. If it looks like we're distracted, it's because we are. Yeah, pretty much. There's lots of things going on on the screen. All right. So, um, so... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm impressed because it really does. You do a great job of this. <laughs> thanks, thanks. We just want to serve, the, you know, we have Auntie Jen who just slipped in in June who's here and as certain 20 who's here and Melissa Finlay just jumped in. So we just hey, want to produce a really good um, product for you guys and for any of you who watch on replay. Oh, if you like this video, if you like this content, will you take a moment and hit that thumbs up bo- um, button? Um that's a, is it a button? I have no there's idea a, what There's it is. a thumb. There's an up. It's a button. So click I the call thumbs it a up just because it signals to YouTube that this is an awesome place to hang out and then maybe some other people will find us while we're live, which was all because you smacked that thumbs up button. And Chris says, and ring the notification bell. Oh, and ring the notification bell. If, if yeah. you didn't know, the subscription on YouTube pretty much means nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but, it, but it means it, it opens up things for us yeah so we get little perks when we get to a certain level but it doesn't automatically spill into your view page so that's why that's why chris is mentioning the notification bill that will actually notify you when something's coming so on to our tip tip number three tip number three Uh, this sounds sexist Uh, sorry focus on the men (laughs) like what's up with that we're talking about the women and you tell us to worry about the men yes it's (laughs) too bad um so of course (laughs) Well, we know you don't have to go back far to find women didn't make a lot of records, didn't create necessarily create a lot of records. And okay. so, but, and the males did. And so, but we can find her, you can find your female ancestors in the males records. Mm-hmm. Now, sometimes, I mean, you can find them say in estate or will records. And sometimes you might just have a married name mm-hmm. and that's okay. Because even if you get a first name, if you had nothing before, at least you got some place to start. Absolutely. Right. So, you can look at that. You can sometimes find women in deeds. Okay. Um, yeah. I have actually found them in deeds listed along with the husband, and I have actually found their maiden name listed. Mm-hmm. Um, That's very good. As you know, in parentheses, maybe they'll say, you know, a ma- put a maiden name in there. I, I, it, it's happened enough that I always tell people to go look 
Right. It doesn't happen very often, but I, I won't say it doesn't happen either. Right. So that's an important thing. Hey, Lisa, real quick with regards yep. to that with deeds, even if the maiden name is not listed there, you should always also take a look at who is either selling the land or who they're buying or who they're selling the land to. Or witnessing. Right. Or witnessing because those may be relatives on the wife's side. Right. And that's exactly what I was going oh, to okay. bring up too. Whether it's, the, well, in deeds or even in wills or pro, like if you're looking through an estate record, is that when you have the, if you're looking at the husband's record and you find the, you know, the wife is named there or maybe a daughter, but I'm thinking wife right now. Make sure when you analyze that document that you identify every person who's mentioned mm -hmm. and know the identity of that person to the male or mm -hmm. and, and or female. Because what I tell people is if that person was important enough to be on that document as a witness, mm -hmm. as a neighbor, as a seller, as a buyer, whatever, they were important to the man who was selling you know, the land or buying the land. If he's important to him, He's important to your female ancestor. Right. And so it's crucial, whether it's a deed, whether it's a will, whether it's an estate record, mm -hmm. that you understand the relationship of every single person mentioned right. Absolutely. in that document. And it, what, what happens is sometimes you end up kind of researching folks that really aren't related, mm -hmm. but that, <laughs> but that's just part of the process. Yeah. You know, They're not to rule people out. Yeah as well as to rule people in yeah. because, you know, you could find a brother listed right. and then you can backdoor into the parents that way type thing. So yeah. it's, it's just so important to really understand, you know, if somebody was important enough to the husband, they're going to be, as far as your research is concerned, they are extremely important to the, to the wife as well. Absolutely. Well, and, um, so I had this misconception with, um, that women couldn't own land. But as I was reading a number of the deeds and the land transfers, the women, mm -hmm. so they would have the deed and then they would have this secondary set that said, we spoke to and named the woman and she signed off that she was a sound mind. She was okay with the sale. And so she mm -hmm. may not have owned the land, but she owned the land, if that makes any sense. So she had to give she permission. She had interest in it, yeah. She had interest, and she had to agree to the signing off of her interest. And for me, I, that was just mind blown because we throw around too many quick quick tips like, oh, they don't own land. But yet, they're turning, sitting there as the one that had to sign off that I give, I, you know, I'm okay with you selling my dial or, you know, transferring my right. dollar right. So right. That, that really had me going in deeper with my women again. Yeah, June uh, on the comments, she just brought up a good point. She says, if it's not a relative yet, <laughs> it may be a relative soon. Mm -hmm. uh, she found right. one deed that was selling land to my great grandfather in April. And in July, he married the daughter of the seller. There you go. Ah, so yeah. at the time they weren't uh, related, but uh, a couple months later they were. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's what I said, you know, you end up researching sometimes people who aren't related to you and you don't know how they fit, but it's never a bad thing because you're learning something about your ancestors community right. and that can come back around. As you said, you end up married, they may marry into the family or there's somehow later you may find those names as well. So or that's they might what... migrate together or have migrated from mm -hmm. where or signing off on different things. So yeah, that community part, they may not be blood, but they definitely right. were family. Yeah. And there's just the more you're immersing your research self into that community, the better off you're going to be so that you recognize your ancestors, male or female, when you actually see them. Mm -hmm. So when we focus on men, what should we do when we're searching in newspapers? How do we find women in newspapers? Oh, that's a little tougher. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I like to tell people is to, when I research in newspapers, the first thing I'm looking for, for when I'm, if I'm use inputting women's names, I'm going to look for the society pages, the okay. community pages. Um, but if I'm looking more for, um, if I'm trying to go along the, the lines of the male, then I'm going to find him, but I want and then I want to make sure I'm reading the entire article. Mm -hmm. That's, it, it just kind of depends on what's going on right. with what yeah. they're doing and what type of article, you know, if it's a political article, you're, you're not really going to find a, a wife mentioned, but <laughs> you know, is if it's, um, you know, Maybe he was involved in a bank robbery. I don't know. <laughs> you might find, then you might find him listed. Right, absolutely. Or listed, you know, as, or mentioned in, in the article as well. 
When I was so. thinking that a lot of times the women, their names will be their male's name. So Mrs. Andy Lee in my case. So okay, I would, yeah. that's, you would search for the male name when you're trying to find the women, and then you would see Mrs. or Mr. to identify right. that you're talking about the women. Yeah. Okay. So what is tip number four? We're tip rocking and rolling. Four. Okay. Consider their roles in the community. Mm-hmm. Okay, this is like one of my favorite parts of the thing. Okay. Um, let's talk about community because women, you know, okay, so they didn't create a lot of maybe formal records, but women were absolutely creating um, a different type of record, an informal record within their communities because okay. they were oftentimes, they're the caregivers. They were the communicators in the family oftentimes, so they're good. they were probably writing letters back and forth. They were might have been writing diaries. Mm -hmm. They might have been nursing. They might have been volunteering in the women's church Mm -hmm. groups, that kind of thing. They were creating community, all of those things. And so they're in some ways touching, they're touching a lot of lives in those Mm -hmm. communities, but they're just not necessarily a formal record, but they're still leaving those traces of themselves there. So So what would we find when we're searching their roles in the community? What would we be looking for? One of the things I look for are community cookbooks okay. for that community where they live because they're usually church or um, civic organization type things. And so women would create some, you know, the committee would put together the, the cookbook and sell it oftentimes like fundraisers kind okay. of things. And so, but you find women in there mm-hmm. and you'll find their names. And so the really beauty of it, if you take like a little church book and you can find these either on your grandmother's bookshelf you can find these at the church if the church still exists. You can find these on Google Books, like okay. from dating back into the 1800s. I have found them on Google Books. You can find them in local libraries, the, com- the county libraries, um, mm-hmm. at the regional areas. So what you find when you open those up is you'll find recipes that women have put in there, and they have oftentimes put their name. So you can put them in a time and a place. Mm-hmm. But here's the catch. Make sure if you find your ancestor, or maybe, maybe if you don't find her, maybe you find siblings or other close relatives who were in there check the front of the book and check the back of the book because that's where they're going to put sometimes histories of that church or maybe that civic organization so if they have a history of a church they're usually telling you where that church is located Mm -hmm. you can get an idea of where your ancestor lived and what um and part of what part of the community that they lived in so you can find that type of thing as well but they will often also list women and um, and they might list them maybe as Mrs. So-and-so, but they might also list them in a, under their just like Mary Smith in a different section if they're listing out different committees that people were on. Yeah, for sure. You can, you can also find original signatures sometimes in those books. Wow. And, here, and here's the kicker. They, those community cookbooks represent her fan club, her okay. community. Because yeah. – Think about it. It's, it's a bit of a role. It's, mm-hmm. a, it's almost like a, 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 a ro- an enrollment type for that that group that they're with because when they're gathering those recipes, every woman's probably going to submit a recipe. Mm-hmm. Maybe, I mean, not everybody probably, but for the most <laughs> Probably part, not me. <laughs> for the most part, because if you didn't, uh-huh. you might be considered a bad cook or mm-hmm. a not a very good husband. <laughs> yeah, but, but, now, early 1900s, would you be raising your hands for that? <laughs> so, so that's just a honest. really, yeah. So that's a really important yeah, um, for thing sure. to look for when it comes to cookbooks and and those kinds of things. So that's a that's one place that I like to look a lot. The other place you can look um, are letters and diaries and journals. Okay. In this, so you find those in special collections, okay. oftentimes at the archives. Okay. Um, and I think we as researchers. I should say I, as a researcher early on, was kind of intimidated by searching the special collections in the archives. You know, it's typically not online and everybody has a different finding aid. And uh-huh. it, yes. <laughs> I'll be honest, North Carolina, at least it used to be, it was a big black notebook, typewritten uh-huh. pages. And you had to pull that down. I'm like, and I mean, you just page, you just literally page through it, page by page. Yes. And I was yes. intimidated because I didn't know, and I really didn't understand. But... So there is actually um, easier ways to find it now. A lot of those archives are starting to put digital collections online, and they mm-hmm. will put – oftentimes they'll have a, a, 
a collection on women okay. and that might have some there. So that's a place to definitely check for those kinds of things. Some are putting things out of their special collections. It's just very, it varies from state to state right. as to what's out there. Um, but use Archive Grid. Are you, do you guys familiar with Archive Grid? Yeah. I'm sure you are. <laughs> so, but a lot of folks don't know about Archive Grid. I was mm-hmm. speaking in South Carolina a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And I asked people about Archive Grid and in an entire room, nobody had used it. Right. So archivegrid.com. Is that right? Dot org. I think it's dot org. Andy we'll find out. Up. Andy's <laughs> on it. But okay, Andy's so so I know that it's there, and I have rarely had any luck with it. So how do we go about finding information in Archive Grid because they're not every name searchable? No, it's not every name searchable, but you can search under locations. Okay. Because you you can filter out. Sometimes I'll start with a surname. Okay. And then I'll filter out by location. And, but, or you can filter out by topic as well. Okay. Um, and so I've had luck with filtering it out. So you'll put specific. the community cookbook, is that what you're saying? And then maybe Halifax, Virginia, or tell me more about that. Walk us or through I it. Might, I might do like Halifax County, Virginia. Okay. And just that is, and then, and then see what comes up and maybe it gives certain papers or maybe it gives certain, um, documents, you know, <laughs> that, that they would have for that. So that would be where I would check. Okay. For those kinds of things. That's when I'm checking for like letters and journals and things like that, like private collections mm-hmm. that somebody might have papers. But here's what here's why I like to look at it. A lot of we talked about migration patterns or mentioned them earlier. So you know it's very common like from North Virginia, North Carolina down through the South and end up in Texas actually. And so what if somebody left Virginia and they ended up in Texas? So they're writing letters back and forth to Virginia. Mm-hmm. Fast forward a bunch of generations. And somebody's got these letters. They don't know what to do with them. They don't want to get rid of them. So they donate them to the local historical society or the local university mm-hmm. collection. But it has a lot of information on North, on North Carolina or Virginia families. But mm-hmm. I would never think to look at this repository because it's in Texas. Why would right. they have a thing? And so that's what Archive Grid can help you identify as some of those types of collections that are somewhere else mm-hmm. that you necessarily know to look for okay and then you mentioned the community so if your ancestor doesn't show up as writing letters and diaries then you start i'm this i'm guessing correct me if i'm wrong start looking for the names of the people in the community is that right okay yeah Yeah. looking for the other names in the community as well okay very good all right so this is the time of the day where you guys who've been listening chris melissa kristen greg auntie jen stacy and the rest of you (laughs) if you have questions about your female ancestors you can start putting those into the comment section right now um but i have melissa's name on my brain and i'm looking at lisa (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Lisa, tell us um, how a situation where you found some success and how did you go about doing it? I think one of the big things that for me when it came, a, a couple of things. One was was definitely networking for somebody. I was, um, I had a bunch of photos. I'm very fortunate. I inherited a large, large collection. Mm-hmm. And so I got them all in line. I had I created a Flickr album out of them, of uh-huh. unknowns. And somebody had said... Um, I, I don't know who this family is that you're asking about, but I think if you ask so-and-so, they might know. So there was a nice little network thing. Okay. Well, here's the catch. So I, I contacted the guy and he said, absolutely. He said, those are my grandparents. And he told me, so, and so here's the catch is this guy lived in Alaska. He was my third cousin twice removed <laughs> yet. He had photographs of my great grandmother. I had photographs of his grandmother. Oh, wow. And it was the one lot, the one and only lot that left Virginia and went to Alaska. Wow. And so it really drove home to me the point. It was like, whoa, yeah, nobody is too far away, literally too mm-hmm. far away <laughs> sure. um, on the tree or distance, not right. to have information. It was amazing. And then come to find out he's literally written a book. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it goes, it's so detailed. I'm in the book, which kind of scared me, but anyway, <laughs> I, was like, I went so far back. I found myself, but um, <laughs> so that was bizarre. So that was one thing. And then um, we didn't really talk about the court records, but um, look for women in court records in the, like cha- I use chancery records out of Virginia a lot. And I had a woman and I, she was my brick wall. I had no idea. It's my great, my fourth great grandmother. I had no idea who she was. Mm-hmm. And Turns out there's quite a story there. And she never, she and my, 
she and, and her husband, well, he wasn't her husband. They never married because she was a widow and she had land and property. Okay. And he was, he was a, um, a, um, gambler. Okay. So she was, she didn't want to marry him because she didn't want to lose her money yeah. and her stuff. I can see and that for sure. So this, so, you know, anyway, there was a whole court court thing because he ended up stealing some of her land from her. And so there was this whole <laughs> court case at the end after uh-huh. on her estate records. So it was an, so what an, it was such an interesting way to go about it. I was actually looking for the husband or I didn't know, I thought he was her husband at the time. I was actually researching him, uh-huh. trying to find something to her. And I, I hit on, I got, I found him in the, in the court records and that's yeah. when it all kind of, um, exploded for me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That's right. Okay. So Andy is scrolling through looking for. Uh, I wanted to say one thing. We found out what city chicken is. Oh, okay. Say Stacy oh, yeah. told us city chicken. It's chicken kebabs and gravy. Oh, okay. Okay. That sounds good, actually. And June also told us that peanut butter and onion sandwiches was a farmer's depression favorite. Oh, my. I like peanut butter. <laughs> I like onions. I don't know if I like them together. Um, yeah, together. peanut butter and onions just doesn't sound appetizing. But. <laughs> but, but, okay, so our kids had a World Food Fest, and we had to do a dish from, I think it was Ireland. And we just had to boil and boil and boil and boil this cabbage and chill. It oh, was, like, yes. translucent. Like, they boiled all the color out of the food and we ate it and it was just like limp plastic but Ooh. i don't exactly remember what it was but that's back then that's what they ate they didn't think the green was good they and they said, didn't have things like pepper or oh, garlic or you know seasoning so to actually make things taste good so bad. <laughs> all right what else do we have um, okay, so Chris has a question here. It says, I have a second great-grandmother who is a brick wall in Italy. I've contacted the town, but no one can really give me much info. What do you think I should do? <laughs> ah, Italy. Uh, I would actually reach out to maybe some of the Italian genealogical societies, the Facebook groups, and mm-hmm. see and reach out to them and ask them kind of how to go about doing that that you might find somebody in that specific area. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the biggest thing. Some I know some of my readers have told me that, that when they reach out to some of the, like, um, the different countries on the Facebook group, mm-hmm. even though, I mean, they're U.S.-based researchers, but that has been very helpful for them because it gives them that, um, helps them learn how to research in that area. What's right. the next step in Italy? Because it is hard. I, I honestly wouldn't know. I would. That's exactly what I would do. Right. Because I would to know how to go about that yeah so um we interviewed someone I'm, I'm really hot it's like insanely hot here in texas and the <laughs> lights are on that's why i keep playing with my hair sorry anyway um so we interviewed a guy named alessandro uh, b i don't know what his last name is alessandro and he's with bella italia and we anytime we get an italian a question we send it to alessandro because he is gonna know the answer so Andy's going to find the link and drop that in. Yep. So I just dropped that, <laughs> that link in good. there. If you want to go to his website, Chris, um, and contact him and, and feel free to tell him that uh, Andy and Devin from Family Street Fanatics sent you. Yeah. He keeps giving us all kind of swag. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> have a hat. It's great. All right. Um, so I think if there's no more questions, are there no more questions? Well, right now. We'll see. Okay. Give it a second. Give it a second. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking to see if there's any other really cool comments that I wanted to highlight here. Well, um, so they did have some uh, discussion about the Bible. We lost our family by it. This is mm-hmm. uh, June. She said that she lost her family by a Bible in a house fire and had information for a Mayflower ancestor connection. Wow. So, That's a shame. Um, I am really big on downsizing and preserving your family history. One of the mistakes that we, I, I made when my mom was downsizing from her home to an apartment she said hey do you want anything and I thought I'd have everything and so I was like no I don't need anything else of yours I don't want your bear collection anyway so after she downsized (laughs) she's like oh I have the German family bible out in the (gasps) shed and I'm like (gasps) and then rats had gotten into the or something yeah yeah nasty stuff and just totally destroyed the bible oh so talk to your family like what do you have so okay here's a question if you find out people have things that you would like to have how do you get it or yeah how do you get it 
<laughs> How do you know? Um, a lot of what I've done is I usually try, well, I try to go visit them and I try to, I'll, I mean, I take them photographs. So I'll take copies of what I've got. And a lot of times I'm not asking for the actual, you know, I tell them I don't want the actual thing. Well, right. I would if they'd give it to me, but <laughs> I, I, I make sure I either take a portable scanner or I take, I've taken a lot of digital photographs of photo, you know, I've taken digital photographs of photographs kind of <laughs> right. thing. Uh, you know, and, and no, it's not the best, but it's better than nothing. Right. Absolutely. Uh, type things. So mm-hmm. that's kind of what I do. Cause I know sometimes, I mean, folks are hesitant. They don't really want to, <laughs> get things out Mm -hmm. or show it to a stranger. And so that's kind of a, kind of a thing, but it's sometimes it just, it takes building a bit of a relationship with that person. So they know, at least they know who you are. Then, you know, they're not, if they just meet you, they're not as likely to just open up the, the boxes of photos or the drawers with letters. in them. it's, you know, sometimes I just need to know you and know that you're not going to do anything weird or just, you know, destroy them or take them off. And so awesome. um, sometimes it's things kind of trickle in. They'll show me some things up front mm-hmm. and then a few then weeks the later, they're saving for later. Yeah. And then a little bit later, they'll either email me or send me something. They're like, you know, mm-hmm. yeah. And I just wish they would hustle up because I just had, speaking of a fire, I just had a cousin who mailed me a box um, last year of some photos and it was so great it took me five years to get them from her well then she's like oh I have another box for you and I'm like okay it'll be five years before I get it <laughs> oh wait I'm gonna come see you in Ohio I'll snag it then oh, she had a flyer before I got there oh wow oh, like, that's seriously? a shame if you're gonna tell me you have something put it in the mail right there I'll pay your FedEx bill like seriously <laughs> Now, that doesn't mean everybody I'm going to pay your FedEx bill if you send something to you. But if it's my family, we might have a conversation. (laughs) Absolutely. Absolutely. Definitely. Yeah, a lot of my collection that I have actually spent 50 years in a barn (laughs) in the South. I'm like, and I can't, I mean, this stuff looked really good. I'm like, yeah, I I was shocked, actually. Yeah, Yeah, it is pretty amazing. We had a friend in Iowa who um, moved.